Alright guys, how's it going? This video is a little late because it started out as a video on Navi. Then after about a day's worth of research, I decided it would be better off as a video on the PlayStation 5. But before long, I noticed that for much of it, I'd been talking about Zen 2. After throwing out a couple of scripts, I realised I had a real problem on my hands. My assumptions were changing over and over the deeper I researched and the deeper I analysed the research. At the same time, all last week, I'd been dealing with applications and questions from viewers and other industry guys who had responded to my call for help. One thing I noted was a couple of requests from people who were willing to help out, but first of all, they wanted my help to learn how to research topics. I don't really need help with researching as that is one of my main skills. I may even have an unfair advantage as I remember little details very keenly. Unusual activity tends to stick in my mind as well. And one example of that was back in June when over at WCCF Tech and at Forbes, on the very same day within only a few hours of each other, both released an article on Navi claiming it was being built for Sony's PlayStation 5. Now, the chances of this happening at random in both of these publications on the same day is pretty close to nil. So both of these articles are clearly worth saving for later. But changing focus a little for now, back to AMD's Next Horizon event and Mark Papermaster again. Right at the start, he talked about how, in 2012, AMD began architecting Zen. Not a huge surprise, as they launched Bulldozer in late 2011. As we know, Zen was ready in early 2017. So that is five years from start to finish. Four to five years, that's how long it takes to develop and launch a new CPU architecture from scratch. Mark and Lisa also both talked about how what we have today is the result of decisions made many years previously. Five years ago, they looked at the data center. They looked at core counts. They looked at how old Moore's law was failing as a result of the manufacturing node slowdown. They knew what had to be done in order to save it and Zen was the answer. Keep that five year thing in mind and now let's switch back to GPU. And discounting RTX for now, the last big change in the GPU state of play was NVIDIA's Maxwell. That was when NVIDIA created a GPU specifically for the gaming market with the launch of the 750Ti, the first generation Maxwell, in February 2014. I was of course following this very closely and I can tell you AMD were extremely concerned by the performance per watt of that card. Up until that point, AMD's low-end cards, cards without a 6-pin requirement that is, were far ahead of Nvidia's, but the 750Ti came in and blew everything else away in that segment. My assumption back in 2014 was that AMD would likely soon counter with their own gaming-focused architecture. We all knew 28 nanometers would be a long-lasting node. Here we can see back in 2010, over at Samsung's foundry, due to the complexity of multi-patterning and the introduction of FinFET transistors at 14 nanometers, 28 nanometers is expected to be a long-lived node with multiple product generations developed on this process. Nvidia understood that, though they also appeared to be under the impression that 20 nanometers might work out for a while before very publicly shaming their partner TSMC in late 2011, claiming that their 20 nanometer process was essentially worthless. But the point here was Nvidia had launched Maxwell in early 2014. Whether they planned it as a 20 nanometer part originally, then moved to 28 nanometers late on, is neither here nor there. What matters is the decision behind the Maxwell GPU. Go back five years from February 2014, and it's 2009. AMD were smashing Nvidia on the graphics front then, and Nvidia knew what they had to do to win. They had to build a pure gaming focused GPU, and Maxwell was that GPU. It just took them four or five years, like any other architecture built from scratch. And I think this next part is lost on many people. Now think about RTX. Nvidia didn't make that decision on a whim last year. They took that decision four or five years ago. Think about that. Four or five years ago, they had just launched the fast gamer-focused GPU, Maxwell, but then instantly decided that they would be going down the RTX route in five years' time. They already knew that unless AMD had also taken that gamer-focused route at the same time Nvidia did with Maxwell, that Nvidia would win easily for the next X years. 
RTX is NVIDIA's game plan for the next five years, at least, believe it. AMD's 28 nanometer game plan was rebranding. Perhaps that's not quite accurate. Perhaps they had planned to do something else with GPU, but simply ran out of money. This article over at Semi-Accurate in 2012 certainly points to multiple product cancellations and a plan called Project Win. Today it seems clear that yes, AMD were out of money and they had prioritised Zen, which we know started in 2012. We've also heard from AMD multiple times in the past though that they took the decision to go all in at 7 nanometers. And in fact, the first 7 nanometer product shipping today is of course Vega Instinct MI60, not Zen 2. Was Project Win basically cancelling everything so they could get back in the game at 7 nanometers? I think now, with hindsight, there's a very good chance that it was. Almost five years of cancelled products just to survive until Zen launched. Now, in recent videos, I've been going down the heavy speculation route. A few videos ago, I talked about how Intel's new server parts may be lacking hyperthreading. That was just speculation. I really have no idea. And in the last video when brainstorming Ryzen, I also speculated on how AMD may be ready to use the same epic I.O. die for Ryzen, basically by cutting it down into quadrants. I also speculated that the die may contain a copy of L3 or L4 cache, whatever. I am well aware that some of this stuff sounds almost fantastical and I'm equally aware that much of it probably won't come true. That's why I labelled it speculation. Speculating on future products is not easy. I don't know anyone who can reliably predict the future 100% of the time, or even 50% of the time. Speculating on AMD is just very difficult at any time because you have to factor in an awful lot of variables. Some people will only look at the engineering perspective without looking at market forces working against AMD. Others look at AMD from a wholly consumer perspective, while not understanding that consumers are absolutely behind the data centre in terms of focus. But even in the consumer markets, AMD's focus has clearly changed over the past few years. When Rory Reid took over at AMD, they were in a hell of a mess and near bankruptcy. Rory saved the company with his semi-custom plan, which as we know came to fruition with the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. Think about what had happened years before then. In the period I talked about during a bunch of videos, including The GPU War Is Over, Innovation vs Rebranding, and most recently this one, How Nvidia Won and AMD Lost The GPU War. They are all telling the same story really, of how AMD's faster, more advanced technology never got the recognition it deserved. That all happened over a three year period around the late 2000s timeframe. Is it really surprising that when AMD executives laid it all out on the table in front of them, they came to the conclusion that Nvidia, while eminently beatable in performance and in tech, were still unbeatable in the minds of the average PC gamer? Is that really so hard to believe? AMD had tried that whole thing where they gave consumers faster cards at cheaper prices and the reward for that was consumers ignored them. The focus had to change. With semi-custom and the console business, AMD now had a steady revenue stream, guaranteed income over the next seven years. Revenue which saved the company. Rory Reid did save AMD while having the hardest time of any AMD CEO in recent history. Because during Rory's tenure, the current products were just not good enough and the near future ones were mostly all cancelled. I had expected AMD to fix their 28 nanometer graphics mistake with FinFETs at the 16 and 14 nanometer nodes, but instead they launched Polaris. I couldn't believe that they had given up fighting the high end in such a way, but they had. And game consoles were clearly ahead on the priority list by then because AMD had decided to shrink the Xbox One on TSMC's new 16 nanometer process rather than try to fight Nvidia in PC. Now you might think that HBM was the reason for the delay in the high end at 14 nanometers with Vega. We did have HBM in 2015 with Fury X, remember? But that card just failed to depose the 980 Ti and was somewhat unviable as a high end card due to only having 4 gigabytes of HBM1. HBM2 would fix that problem, but a lot later. Vega was always planned to come later than Polaris and the roadmap is clear. So it's clear that AMD had decided to give up fighting Nvidia at the high end for the early part of 14 nanometers. That was another change of focus as up till that point, they had always launched a new high end GPU on the new node 
as soon as they could. And before I change focus again, note right at the end of that roadmap, Navi, complete with scalability and next-gen memory. Next-gen memory, although giving the impression of being something perhaps quite exotic, could just as easily mean GDDR6. Scalability is one of those words that can mean 10 different things, which is likely why they chose it. A few days ago, a Reddit user by the name of Ruthenic Cookie leaked information that the next PlayStation would have a Ryzen 8 core CPU and the price of $500. Why should we believe a random Reddit poster? Well, the same post actually leaked Sony's omission from E3 2019, a day early. Ruthenic Cookie went on to mention one or two other interesting snippets, including a performance teaser labeling the PlayStation 5 a 4K 60 stable and at the same time, kind of monster. So clearly we're looking at a huge increase in performance compared to the current console generation. And 4K 60 FPS is obviously a bit more than what even the average to average high-end gaming PC can manage today. Nobody was exactly surprised by yet another claim of an 8-core Ryzen console chip though. In fact, various outlets have been suggesting this for some time now. And as it happens, even I myself had started talking about it on Twitter too after my last video. And I literally almost never even talk about consoles. But simply put, when I saw that tiny 72 square millimeter 8 core Ryzen 2 chiplet at AMD's Next Horizon event, I immediately came to the conclusion that this would be seeing a lot of different products. Some have analysed this leak as being too early for Zen 2 in development boards, so it must be Zen 1, but if so then the same would surely apply to Navi. Using Zen 1 cores doesn't really make sense from an area or power perspective either, so I think it is fairly certain that the PlayStation 5 will have Zen 2 cores. And not only that, but I believe it may just be this exact chiplet. Now I'm obviously a big fan of chiplets. I'm also a fan of stuff like economies of scale. See, when you understand AMD's predicament, you start looking at how they'll get out of that predicament. That predicament is they have two much larger, extremely aggressive competitors. Intel in particular have a huge amount of manufacturing behind them which is required to produce 90% of the world's 300 million or so x86 CPUs. Realise that no matter how far AMD beats Intel in performance, performance per watt or price, those 300 million sales still need to be made every year. Right now Intel can't manufacture enough chips to sell, even though they've been stuck with the same architecture on 14 nanometers for the last 100,000 years or so. Manufacturing, not performance, is the key to market share. We already know about the brilliance of Zen 1 in manufacturing terms. That chip was seen in packages of up to 4 CPUs, for up to 32 cores in a socket, and also down as far as being usable as a quad core. That's one definition of scalable. Recall back to my Interposers Chiplets and Butter Donuts video when I discussed how clock speed can be dramatically increased through the speed binning of chiplets on a wafer. Obviously, speed binning is a constant process over every single wafer. Every chip on every wafer is tested and binned. Just imagine a bunch of bins, each labelled from 1.4 GHz to 3.2 GHz here, to make it easy, with the fastest chips being tested and placed in the 3.2 GHz bin, while the slowest chips are placed in the 1.4 GHz bin. The really cool thing about this from an economy of scale perspective is that the more wafers you test, the more chips that you bin, the higher the top bin can be. Look more closely at this chart, concentrating on the red and white sorted chips. We can see that most of the chips are average, that's why it's shaped like a bell curve. The slowest chips are 1.8 GHz and the fastest are 3.1. So you may think that if they were to be sold as a new Ryzen series of chips, then the fastest one you could buy would be 3.1 GHz. But they are actually so few in number that it's not even worth it. Simply put, it wouldn't be worth it for AMD to brand and validate these chips for the consumer market. In every 100 wafers, only, what's that, two? Only two chips are good enough to make the top 3.1 GHz bin. Even the 3 GHz chips are perhaps only 3 in 100. AMD doesn't bin those as Ryzen. They bin these chips as Epic and Threadrippers, which we've seen, the top 5%. While these more numerous 2.9 GHz chips would be the highest bin Ryzen's. But what if 1000 wafers were speed binned? Well, not only would we see a 10 times increase in the number of Epic and Threadripper potential chips, 
would start to find chips that were even better than 3.1 GHz, perhaps even as high as 3.3 GHz. This is simply about scale, and the more chips you test, the more likely you'll find something extreme. What if it were a 100,000 wafer speed bend? Would we see as high as 3.5 GHz? Possibly. Obviously, there will be a final limit to how fast you will get on a process, but the more wafers you manufacture, the closer you will get to that limit with more chips. So 3.1 GHz would no longer be the highest end for Epic. They would be the highest end Ryzen SKU instead. It's the same for Intel. You think of the recent 8086K. They cherry-picked the 50,000 best CPUs they could manufacture, stuck it into a limited edition SKU that was capable of 4 GHz base and 5 GHz turbo. If they had had a bunch more chips capable of that kind of performance level, they'd have created a higher SKU out of it at launch. But they don't. The 8700K was 3.7 GHz base and 4.7 GHz turbo. For a reason. That was the point of the curve where Intel could create a SKU that would sell perhaps a million 8700K CPUs. If Intel had 20 times more manufacturing ability, they would have been able to create this 4 GHz base, 5 GHz turbo SKU and sell around a million of those instead. That is just one aspect of having scale, size, on your side. So why doesn't AMD just bin as many of those tiny Zen 2 chiplets as possible? Manufacture all the wafers they can afford and make massive inroads into Intel's market share. Well, it's pretty risky. For one thing, chiplets still need motherboards. The mobile guys can see that Ryzen is slowly making inroads into Intel's market share, but they aren't about to switch a huge amount of production from Intel motherboards to AMD motherboards overnight, because they know, or well they thought they knew at least, that Intel can provide them with all the chips they need to satisfy the 300 million market hunger. That has of course been proven untrue recently, with the Intel shortage and them rightly prioritising data centre during that. The motherboard guys don't care if you buy Intel or AMD, they only care that you buy motherboards. They have undoubtedly noted Intel's lack of ability to provide them with chips during this shortage, but it still takes time to change old attitudes. So is AMD basically stuck, even with their brilliant chiplet architecture, with only a smallish improvement in clock speeds due to lacking the scale required? And in a horrible catch-22 situation? The lack of that extra performance is just the kind of thing that would prevent mass scale switching from Intel to AMD by the motherboard guys. You see the massive advantage that Intel has over AMD simply based on their sheer size. Intel is getting faster performance almost for free due to their massively higher production and sales. While AMD can't afford to massively produce chips that may not sell, for example due to mother guys' fear of Intel reprisals, or even just a lack of trust by the motherboard guys. But there is that other market AMD has, right? The game consoles. 30 million of them sold every year, which is more than every AMD CPU put together. 30 million of those sold every year, PlayStation 4, Xbox One combined, and basically guaranteed for the next 7 years. Game consoles don't need to have incredible performance per watt, or ultimate clock speed. In fact, they can easily be some of the worst chips on the wafer. 8 7nm Zen 2 cores running at just over a couple of gigahertz? That is very low power, and much higher performance than the current generation. Let's go back to the diaper wafer calculator for this next part. After the last video, I came to realise that I was likely over generous with the state of TSMC's 7nm yield curve. Remember back to an older video, the Epic Master Plan, where at the beginning of it I discussed how fab yield was dropping with each new node, simply due to the huge increase in the number of extra process stages and 7 nanometers had a very large jump in complexity. If we allow for that and just use a 0.4 defect density rate rather than the previous 0.3, and we'll use the same Zen 2 core chiplet of 7.1 by 10.1 millimeters. So on a 300 millimeter wafer, with the 0.4 defect density, there will be around 200 defective dyes on the wafer. But what makes a dye defective? Well, when they're being tested during the wafer test and sort, which is basically the same as binning, each chip will be tested for open and short circuits. A dead or defective chip will fail that simple test. And where are you most likely to see a defect in an 8 core chiplet? It's much more likely to be on one of the cores, or on the cache. That is what the vast majority of these 200 defective dies are. Chiplets with one, two, maybe even three dead cores. We know that they can be binned and sold as Athlons or low-end Ryzen's. 
the Ryzen 3s and the Ryzen 5 1500X were of course quad core CPUs. Looking at Mine Factory sales over the last year, and as an FYI, Mine Factory appeared to be one of those retailers specifically targeted by AMD for Ryzen. So the market share numbers you see here against Intel are definitely not being reflected everywhere. However, what this does give you is a good indication of AMD's most popular chips. And it's a high end and mid range, the 2700s and the 2600s, with the quads down here barely even getting a look in. Of course, if you wanted a quad core, Intel gave you plenty of chances over the previous 10 years. Some of you might look at this and wonder if it's an accurate reflection of yield, but it's not. In fact, many of these ones here, the pink and the green and white, that's your six core 2600s, AMD will be fusing off and binning perfectly good 8 core chips as these 6 core chips simply to make a sale in the mid range. Now here is a die shot of the 28 nanometer PlayStation 4 from Chipworks which is a company that analyzes microchips at the transistor level. And looking at the PS4 die there are 3 clear standout elements. You've got this large 20 compute unit AMD Radeon graphics portion. You've got the dual quad core Jaguar X86 CPU cores and you've got the memory controllers which are shared between the CPU and GPU. For comparison, taking a quick look at the 28 nanometer Xbox One die, we can see many similar elements. You've got the same quad core Jaguar X86 CPU cores, however the Xbox One also had a huge amount of space given over to integrated SRAM cache. A curious decision and the main reason why the console only had 14 instead of 20 Radeon graphics cores. The PlayStation 4 only had 18 usable cores of course, not 20. Why manufacture a chip with 20 cores but only 18 usable? Well there's a really good reason for it. It's called redundancy and means that if part of this graphics was hit with a manufacturing defect, the chip would still be absolutely fine for inclusion as a PlayStation 4. And in fact there could be two defects on this, so long as three of the cores aren't hit by a killer defect, this is absolutely fine to be sold as 18 graphics cores. But what about hitting one of these CPU cores? If that happens, the whole system on chip is dead. There are no PlayStation 4s with 5, 6 or 7 cores, they all have 8. The rest of this chip could have been miracle class silicon. But it wouldn't matter because unless it has 8 working CPU cores, it's not a PS4. Why would you build a chip like that again in 2020? A chip that is likely to last 3 or 4 years at least. We will have chiplets in 2019. Why now regress to a monolithic system on chip in 2020? Because it's cheap? It's not cheap. Every single dead core is a dead PS5. Larger chips are harder to manufacture. Why build a monolithic chip in 2020 when you have the choice not to? And of course you got my point a while ago. The PS4 and the Xbox One already are basically two quad core chips. All these defective dies being manufactured right now, almost one in four, those are still millions of quad cores being manufactured in 2019. Just in time for the next console generation in 2020. And with the high volume manufacturing, the guaranteed console sales allow. The highest end parts, your Epics, your Threadrippers, your Ryzen's, they all get shifted up a tier or two in terms of clock speeds, in terms of performance per watt. Like I said, this is just speculation. I don't know if this is what AMD is doing, but I'm pretty sure it's what they should be doing. They need to utilize every manufacturing advantage that chiplets gives them without fear in both the core chiplets and in the I.O. die. At the start of this extremely long video, I said it was planned as a video on Navi. By now you can probably figure out why the video is late. Of course the most important part of a game console is the GPU. Though it appears nobody told Microsoft that back when they were developing the original Xbox One. Navi is a 4K 60fps stable kind of monster. But what else is it? Again, I've been following it fairly loosely all year, bookmarking the articles that I would come back to later. And a couple stood out for various reasons. Back in April over at Fudzilla, AMD Navi is no high-end GPU. What's coming in 2019 will likely be the replacement for Polaris. That's what makes sense in today's environment of hugely increased manufacturing cost, especially earlier in a process node. As we can see from this AMD slide, 7 nanometers, way more expensive at the same point compared to 14 and 16. And also according to Fadzilla, the earliest they would expect the high-end chip 
would be at some point in 2020. PC Games N also had a couple of very interesting articles released around the Computex timeframe. This was one of them. AMD Navi GPUs don't have to be tied to HBM2. It can also work very well with GDDR6. And in this article, they talked with the Radeon Technology Group's David Wang and Scott Herkelman. In this article, Wang basically spelled out the problem with HBM2. While it's a superior technology, in performance terms, it's too expensive for the consumer markets, and certainly for the game consoles. And at the end, he says, We have a baseline technology, and our graphics architecture is scalable, is flexible, and it can work with HBM effectively, and can also work well with GDDR6. And for me, one of the biggest scoops of the year was again at PC Games N when, again talking to David Wang and Scott Herkelman, they discovered that AMD's Navi will be a traditional monolithic GPU, not a multi-chip module. Now it's safe to say that few were more disappointed by this than I was. Wang said, we are looking at the MCM type of approach, but we've yet to conclude that this is something that can be used for traditional gaming graphics type of application. Continuing with, to some extent you're talking about doing crossfire on a single package. The challenge is that unless they make it invisible to the ISVs, that's the independent software vendors, their game developers basically, you're going to see the same sort of reluctance. History has proven that developers simply aren't interested in the extra work and hassles that SLI and Crossfire bring. It may have been a different story had more than 1% of the player base used multi-GPU setups, but less than 1% did. Later on in the article, Scott Herkelman says, That's gaming. In professional and instinct workloads, multi-GPU is considerably different. They are all in on that side. Even in blockchain applications, they are all in on multi-GPU. Gaming on the other hand, again, has to be enabled by the ISVs, and the ISVs see it as a tremendous burden. We learned during Next Horizon that Vega Instinct MI60 is very scalable in multi-GPU, near linear scaling up to 8 cards in fact which is superb scaling. So when asked if Radeon Gaming and Radeon Pro market chips would diverge, Wang ended with, Yeah, I can definitely see that. Because of one reason we just talked about, one workload is a lot more scalable and has different sensitivity on multi-GPU or multi-die communication versus the other workload or applications that are much less scalable on that standpoint. Of course, he's talking about gaming there. So yes, he can definitely see the possibility that architectures will start diverging. I recently learned of an Instinct MI100, which is almost certainly a dual GPU 7nm Vega card. Dropping clock speeds by say 20% on the very best silicon will save tons of power on each chip. And you'll end up with a card that is around about 60% faster for maybe only 40% more power overall. In the data center, any performance per watt saving is worth it. So we will see, and are now seeing, a true split of Radeon products. One for the data center, and one for the consumer market. Just like Nvidia has had for years now, and also the main reason why Nvidia pulled so far ahead on the desktop. Now don't expect massive differences between the segments though. As Wang says, there will be tweaks so that for computation it may be biased to one kind of architecture and gaming will be biased to another type of architecture. But I think the fundamental building blocks and concept will still be pretty similar. So for example, machine learning cards could use HBM and gaming cards will use GDDR6, just like they said was possible in the previous article at PC Games N. But there's zero need for double precision on a gaming card, so that can be cut out saving power, which can be used to increase clock speed or FP32 shaders instead. Basically just how Nvidia did it with Maxwell, and ditto any fixed function machine learning hardware. There's no need for that on a gaming GPU. Though of course what's interesting about that is we already know Nvidia's architectures are beginning to converge again with the inclusion of tensor cores in Turing. When Navi launches in 2019, it'll have been 5 years since Nvidia launched Maxwell. 5 years. And if you remember back to what Papermaster said about Zen, what Lisa Su has been saying a lot recently, and even what Rory Reed Slade said back in 2012, you're not skating towards the puck, you're skating to where the puck is going. Performance is a moving target. Five years ago, AMD's GPU division must have made the decision to compete with Maxwell somehow. 
They clearly had no answer for the following five years, but perhaps Navi is it for the next five, starting next year. Could we finally be about to see AMD's Maxwell? When Fudzilla recently reported that AMD had Navi back in the labs and doing better than expected, I wasn't really surprised. They still maintain it's a GPU for the mid-range, but the mid-range is also a moving target every generation. It just hasn't moved very far recently due to rebranding and Turing not really pushing the performance envelope. What these guys are calling mid-range though, I call low-end. And interestingly, at the bottom, Fudzilla also claims Navi is expected to be succeeded by 7nm plus next-gen architecture, rumoured to be called Arcturus, coming in 2020. Over at WCCF again a couple of weeks ago, and an exclusive suggesting the first Navi GPU will have 40 compute units and be codenamed Navi 12. Some of this stuff is way easier to analyse than others because many sources are saying the same thing. Navi 12 appears to be a continuation of the mainstream upgrade path that the Polaris series has become famous for. Again, this is no high-end GPU. And when Usman asked if the GPU was what they can expect to see featured in the PS5, the answer was no. Navi 12 is not going to be the GPU that gets featured in the PS5. Even more interesting were a couple of points on the roadmap TLDR at the end. Vega 7 nanometers will not be coming to gamers. This one was pretty much confirmed multiple times now. Navi will also be the first architecture to transition away from GCN, and next gen architecture is the micro architecture formerly codenamed Kuma internally before AMD decided it didn't like that name, and that this next gen architecture will be based on the same brand new architecture that AMD rolls out with Navi. Now those two were quite intriguing and clearly different from what we were told over at Fudzilla. The name could easily have been changed from Kuma to Arcturus, so that's absolutely fine. However, Fudzilla said that the new big change architecture comes with Arcturus in 2020, while WCCF says it's coming with Navi in 2019. WCCF source appears to be a lot more specific on details, which is generally a good thing regarding reliability. However, specific details are also more easily brought to question. So I searched for evidence of Navi being a new microarchitecture, and I found this. A Reddit post by an AMD engineer in Markham. So a Radeon Technologies Group guy who said, All cards after the 6000 series are GCN architecture. Polaris, Vega, Navi, all upgraded microarchitecture. So you can see the difficulty in analysing this stuff reliably. I am, of course, much more likely to believe the RTG engineer regarding the new microarchitecture. And that also means the Fudzilla article about Arcturus, or whatever the arch after Navi is called, is likely to be the really big change instead and coming in 2020. So what does that leave for Navi? Was it created specifically for the PS5? Well, that would help to explain a lot but it made me wonder if that could be a good thing too. Let's say Navi is a top to bottom architecture again, like AMD used to do before Polaris. We can be pretty certain from comments by David Wang and Scott Herkman that it is not an MCM architecture, at least not in the PC. I toyed with the idea that perhaps it was a dual GPU chiplet on the PS5. Remember the biggest problem with Crossfire is that the ISVs don't want to use it, and few consumers have more than one GPU anyway. But AMD and Sony could force developers to use it on the PS5 because it's a closed system, but I don't think so. I don't think Navi is using multiple GPU dies on PC or the PS5. However, why can't the Navi chip planned for the PlayStation 5 also be a desktop Navi chip? If you look at the Navi codenames going around, we have Navi 10, Navi 12 and Navi 20. So there appears to be three of them at least. Navi 12 appears to be coming first and is the Polaris replacement. Let's call that a 150 square millimeter GPU at around about 100 to 120 watts of power. It may have what we think of as mid-range performance today. Both WCCF and Fudzilla says around Vega 56 performance. But mid-range performance today is low-end performance tomorrow. Navi 12 is almost certainly a low-end GPU, coming first of all on the new 7 nanometer process. WCCF talks about Navi 20 being the big one in the 2020 timeframe. Fudzilla speculates similarly, neither this low-end Navi 12 nor this high-end Navi 20 
a PS suitable for the PlayStation 5. The low-end Navi 12 one wouldn't really appear to be fast enough for this 4K 60fps stable kind of monster justification. The large one, Navi 20, is likely coming too late for the PlayStation 5 and will draw too much power anyway. The PlayStation 5 will have a power budget of around 175 watts, and that's for the whole system, realistically leaving around 150 watts maximum for the GPU. But there should be something else in between Navi 12 and Navi 20. Call it the long speculated Navi 10 or whatever. Perhaps the best way to think about these is in terms of NVIDIA's last generation Pascal chips, where they have GP102, GP104 and GP106. And take a look at how Navi should match up to those. GP102 is the high-end Titan X and 1080 Ti. 3840 CUDA cores at 471 square millimeters. GP106, the GTX 1060 chip, was 1280 CUDA cores. Even though it only has one third the number of shaders, it's a lot more than only one third of the size. The Navi 12 Polaris replacement would be in this segment, and on 7 nanometers, we'd be talking maybe around a 150 square millimeter chip. The really interesting one is the middle chip. For Nvidia, that would be GP104. The GTX 1080 class of GPU that had twice the number of shaders, 2560, off the GTX 1060, but only 57% larger die size. 314 square millimeters versus 200 square millimeters. At around 180 watts on a desktop card, that's easily a 150 watt GPU with a mild underclock. Just what you would expect from, say, uh, around 235 square millimeter Navi 10 on 7 nanometers. Performance should be nearby the 1080 Ti level, or maybe in between the 1080 and 1080 Ti. Enough to justify a 4K 60fps kind of monster label. Again, I'm aware this probably sounds fantastical, and don't get me wrong, this is a lot of silicon. I'm suggesting one or two 7 nanometer CPU Zen 2 chiplets, and now a 7 nanometer around 235 square millimeter GPU. For the final part of the video, I'll do a silicon cost breakdown on various chips and chiplets. As I'm not privy to much more than estimations of wafer cost and yield, these numbers will be estimates. However, they are unlikely to be very far from the truth. So let's start with the PlayStation 4, manufactured on TSMC's 28 nanometers and a die size of 348 square millimeters, an almost square 19 by 18.3 millimeters. As we know, it's a monolithic chip with all the drawbacks that brings to yield. The PlayStation 4 arrived to market around two years after the first 28 nanometer GPU, which was AMD's 7970. So by that point, the process was fairly mature. Let's call it 0.15 defects per square centimeter. As we can see, that gives us a fab yield of only 61% and 60 defective dies. Regarding salvaging though, the GPU is around one third of the total die, so around about one third of the defects should be salvageable, leaving 40 defective dies. So with all of that, the total yield of that large monolithic chip is 74%. Now if we just run all of this through the silicon cost calculator, 348 die size, 0.74 yield, and a wafer price of 4000 and we get a final cost per silicon die of around $32. So that was the silicon cost of one PlayStation 4 chip. Now what about something more recent? Let's use the Xbox One X's Scorpio engine, again manufactured at TSMC, but this time on 16 nanometers. It's a much more rectangular 360 square millimeters, and I can't find its exact dimensions, but let's call it 22.5 by 16 millimeters. Again, it's a monolithic chip with all of the drawbacks. The Xbox One X arrived to market around a year and a half after the first 14 nanometers GPU. So let's call that a 0.2 defect per square centimeter process and around about $7,000 per wafer. Remember, these would actually have been manufactured six months previously. Same with any console chip. And that is a yield of barely 51%. Now again, the Xbox One X used some redundancy in the GPU. And let's be generous saying half of these defects are salvageable, leaving only 36 defective dies and a total yield of 75.5%. Now 
Now, running all those numbers through the silicon cost calculator, 360 die size, 0.755 yield, and 7,000 wafer price, and we get $58 per chip. That's nearly double the cost of the old PlayStation 4, but that is the price that you pay for higher performance on a newer node. Of course, the Xbox One X launched at $500, not $400, so costs like these can be recouped, and then some. Remember the leaker over at Reddit said the PlayStation 5 will be a $500 console. So let's do a hypothetical monolithic PlayStation 5 chip. The Zen 2 chiplets likely include a lot more L3 cache than required for a games console. So 8 cores in a monolithic PlayStation 5 chip would likely be much, much smaller than 2 of these Zen 2 chiplets. Let's just call it 50 square millimetres for 8 cores and some cache. As I said earlier, around 235 square millimetres for the GPU though. That's much larger than the previous PlayStation 4's graphics cores in order to hit that 4K 60 frames per second stable. Now some of that area will of course be used for redundancy and salvaging too. And here's another potential issue regarding size and yield. The more powerful the GPU is, the more bandwidth it needs. So the PlayStation 5 may require a 384-bit memory bus rather than 256-bit. But I'm gonna be generous and just go with the old PlayStation 4 size of 348 square millimetres. That is a lot of silicon on 7 nanometers. Remember that 7 nanometer cost breakdown slide from AMD? You're talking nearly double, and that was for a 250 square millimetre chip. The larger the chip on 7 nanometer, the worse this gets. But back to the yield calculator, and we'll use the same dimensions as the PlayStation 4. So 19 by 18.3. Again, it's a monolithic chip with all the drawbacks. The PlayStation 5 will likely arrive to market around that same 1.5 to 2 years after the first consumer products. So let's take a defect density of 0.2 again. And before salvaging, we can see a pretty low yield of only 52%. And that is a lot of defective dies, but many of them will presumably be salvageable due to the large GPU redundancy. Let's say overall two thirds are salvageable for a total number of 25 defective dies and a total yield of 83%. And back to the silicon cost calculator. 348 die size, 0.83 yield, and let's say $9,000 wafer price, giving us a final cost per die of around $65 for this hypothetical PlayStation 5 monolithic chip. That is actually not too bad. It is not so far away from the cost of the Xbox One X. So the last thing we need to do is try to figure out the cost of my even more hypothetical PlayStation 5 MCM. And let's start with the Zen 2 chiplet die. 7.1 millimeters by 10.1 millimeters. The difference is we're gonna use TSMC's current process, which as I said, could be around the 0.4 defect density. 200 defective dies, except we already know what makes a die defective, and it's a dead core. If my hypothetical PlayStation 5 uses two four core chiplets, basically speaking, nearly all of these 200 defective dies will be salvageable. The chances of five cores in a single chiplet being hit by a defect is basically nil. But there will be a few other critical elements hit that can't be salvaged. Let's just call it a total yield of 98%. And even with a current wafer price of around $12,000 per wafer, the cost per silicon die of the Zen 2 chiplet comes in around $13.50. Now we still need a GPU. Let's call it Navi 10. The same chip I'd be using previously at 235 square millimetres. Except it's not really 235 square millimetres. It's actually only 200 square millimetres. I'll explain that later. You'll just have to trust me on that for now. Now that GPU isn't actually being manufactured right now. We know that because we know Navi 12, the low end part, comes first, with Navi 10 coming later. If Navi 10 is the same GPU used in the PlayStation 5, then it will get manufactured in preparation for the PlayStation 5's launch. So what we'll do is we will use the same yield rates and wafer cost of the hypothetical monolithic die. So that was a defect density of 0.2 and the wafer cost of 9,000. And we'll just go with a 16 millimeter by 12.5 millimeter dimensions for a 200 square millimeter die. And this gives us a fab yield of 68%. 
with 90 defective dice. Remember though, for the monolithic die, I allowed two thirds of these defective dice to be salvageable due to GPU redundancy. In this case, I'll allow three quarters. Again, I'll explain that in a minute, but on this wafer, around 22 should be defective. That's a total Navi 10 chip yield of 92%. And going back to the silicon cost calculator, 200 size, 92 yield and 9,000 price gives us a final cost per silicon die of $32. Remember the hypothetical monolithic PlayStation 5 chip cost around $65. The chiplet one currently costs $59. $27 for two Zen 2 chiplets and $32 for this Navi 10 GPU. I see currently, and I'm sure many of you have realized that something is still missing here. If you're going to use the Zen 2 chiplets, you're also going to need an I.O. die. And the reason why this Navi 10 chip I used is smaller than the one in the monolithic PlayStation 5, it's because the Navi 10 chip doesn't contain any memory controllers, same as the Zen 2 chips don't. So we need an I.O. die. And here is where it gets absolutely beautiful. Looking back over some articles and the one at PC Games N came to mind. No, not the MCM one. The one with Navi being GDDR6 and HBM compatible. When AMD's Scott Herkelman was asked if the data center or heavily compute focused cards remain tied to HBM2 while the gaming cards shift to GDDR6, he replied with, I would say it's opportunistic. It depends on how we see our roadmap, how we would like to play it out with some of our partners and the innovations we want to have and what we want to do in the professional space. But we are fully committed to HBM and we're going to be fully committed to GDDR6 and let the best solution win. And later on, David Wang agreed. Like Scott said, it is definitely opportunistic. We have a baseline technology and our graphics architecture is scalable is flexible and it can work with HBM effectively and it can also work very well with GDDR6. In the last video, Brainstorming Ryzen, I suggested that the large I.O. die for Epic and Threadripper could be cut into quadrants for the consumer market. Ryzen needs an I.O. die too and I was thinking about how to save cost. That's what AMD does. They think about cost first of all and then engineer ways making it work. Well, throw out that idea for now. Epic and Threadripper can use that huge die, with Threadripper using the salvage parts. So how would a Ryzen I.O. die look? Well, I'd wager it would look an awful lot like a PlayStation 5 I.O. die. And I'd wager that I.O. die was filled with memory controllers. On the older, cheaper 14 nanometers, of course. I'd wager that I.O. die contained not only DDR4 controllers, but also GDDR6 and HBM2 controllers. With the controllers on the I.O. die, any Navi chiplet can theoretically fit any segment. Even the entry-level Navi 12 could be used with HBM, but more likely though it will be used as the cheap APU and utilise the same DDR4 as the Zen 2 chiplets. Or perhaps cheap gaming PCs with GDDR5 instead. Think about that for a minute. APUs are about to get pretty interesting. Navi 10, the same mid-range chip being used in the PlayStation 5 with GDDR6, could also be used in laptops with HBM2. Sounds like something Apple could be interested in. Navi 20, perhaps a high-end consumer GPU with GDDR6 or a Radeon Instinct with HBM2. There is your Navi scalability. There is your next-gen memory. It's the I.O. die that is next generation, not the GPU. And the beauty of this is, if you're going to be wanting one of these parts, you may as well get all of it together. Whether you're a system builder or a laptop maker, you may as well go ahead and buy all of this at once. Save yourself a fortune and AMD takes a very large chunk of market share, not only from Intel, but Nvidia too. But how large would this consumer I.O. die have to be? Well, HBM2 controllers are really not that big. Looking at this 14 nanometer Vega die shot, we can see two 1024-bit HBM2 interfaces, and together those are under 25 square millimeters. It's unlikely that a consumer-focused I.O. die would need more than two of these. And looking at Polaris here, we've got around about 25 square millimeters again for this 256-bit GDDR5 interface. Now, of course, we're using GDDR6 now, and that will be a little larger, 
but it is, however, backwards compatible with GDDR5. Now let's call that around about 30 square millimeters for a 256 bit GDDR6 bus, reflecting why I used 200 square millimeters for the Navi 10 GPU on the chiplet PS5, remember, instead of 235 square millimeters on the monolithic PS5. The GDDR6 interface was the main difference there. But remember I said earlier that due to the extra performance, the PlayStation 5 may need a 384-bit bus. This would also be required for a high-end Navi 20 with GDDR6. So let's actually go with that 384-bit bus and we'll call the whole thing 45 square millimeters. And all that would be left now would be the DDR4 buses on the other side. And those will be around 30 square millimeters. So 25 square millimeters for the HBM2 bus, 45 square millimeters for a 384-bit GDDR6 bus, and 30 square millimeters for the DDR4 bus. So overall, that die with all those memory controllers is 100 square millimeters. Let's just call it 125 square millimeters overall. And over to the die yield calculator for the final time. We'll just make it simple, 12.5 by 10. That's 125 square millimeters. And using the other parameters for Global Foundry's 14 nanometers, as you can see, 90 and a half percent yield and 44 defective dies. But if you think about this one, anything that's going to be defective on this I.O. die is going to be a memory controller. And it'll either be one of the DDR4 memory controllers, the GDDR6 memory controllers, or the HBM2 memory controllers. The chances of all three being hit by a killer defect, pretty much nil. So in actual fact, yield here would be 99 to 100% yet again. So over to the silicon cost calculator for the final time and a die size of 125, we'll go with a yield of 0.99 and the wafer price now will be around about $3,000 for Global Foundry's 14 nanometers. 506 of them on the wafer and as you can see a silicon cost per die of $6. Remember, the two Zen dies and the Navi 10 GPU cost $59. So an extra $6 now and we're at $65, the exact same cost of the monolithic 7 nanometers PlayStation 5 die. And over time, the cost of the chiplet one will lower dramatically. And of course, there's no real need to use both of those Zen 2 dies. There's actually a very high chance that those defective Zen 2 dies all 200 of them on the wafer, the vast majority of those would be absolutely fine as 6 core CPUs. So really, this hypothetical chiplet PlayStation 5 could easily just have one 8 core Zen chiplet, and that would save $13.5. I simply used the two of them for effect, to show how even defective silicon can be used in something like this. What about performance though? Clearly, with an I.O. die, off the main die, there's going to be a penalty to latency. That is simply unavoidable. However, it can be mitigated with other architecture changes. For example, a larger L2 cache, which interestingly is the direction that NVIDIA took with their last architecture. But simply put, the ability to move the memory controllers off die allows you to recoup that space for shaders allowing more performance in the same die space anyway. If this isn't what AMD has planned, then I'm going to be really interested to see what they have planned. But hopefully we'll find out about that one before too long. But even better from AMD's perspective is of course the economy of scale they get out of it. They can mass produce that PlayStation 5 Navi 10 GPU die. The very best performance per watt parts can go to mobile. The highest performance parts can be RX 680s. This all helps to drag up the average selling price of the chip, effectively lowering the overall cost of each die. And of course, According to the leaker again, the PlayStation 5 will cost more than the PlayStation 4, $100 more. AMD will be asking for more this time around, and a decent chunk of that extra $100 will be theirs. In my recent Global Foundries video, I believe it was, I was concerned about how AMD were going to be able to manufacture everything at TSMC 7 nanometers, Zen 2, Vega Instinct, GPU, games consoles. So I speculated that Ryzen and Navi on the desktop would be deprioritized due to this. But with the same Zen 2 and Navi chiplets being reused in almost everything, they can in fact get away with only using TSMC. What's more, with the last wafer supply agreement, where they agreed to pay Global Foundries for each wafer they bought elsewhere, wafer, not chip, 
This chiplet method is a cunning way to pay less due to huge amounts of reuse and basically nearly 100% yield per wafer. 7 nanometer chiplets all done at TSMC and 14 nanometer IO dies all done at Global Foundries. And the pros just keep on coming. There's also less need to worry about inventory build up for any one segment. What if Ryzen sales aren't going so well? Just use the Zen 2 chiplets and consoles, which are practically guaranteed sales. It is all so obvious now, but hindsight always is. Do I truly believe the PlayStation 5 will be a multi-chip design? Well, let's just call it hope rather than expectation. The fact here is, all of this I just talked about had to be planned four or five years ago, not with hindsight. That is long before even Zen 1 existed in silicon form, let alone Zen 2. But just like with the A-Team, I love it when a plan comes together. Here's the A-Team today, but I'm still not sure if this plan this evolved master plan is ready to come together quite yet. There are some smart people in control at AMD these days, but I do wonder if there's still not enough integration there between the CPU, GPU and semi-custom divisions to plan something like this so far ahead of time. Do I believe future game consoles will be chiplet architectures? Of course. Like I said on Twitter, everything out of AMD will be chiplets by the end of 7 nanometers. They are just too good not to use. And if Navi is GCN's last hurrah, then what a way to go out. I'll catch you later, guys. <laughs>